Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Astro Chats. I'm your Erica Wright, your Youth Astronet Community Coordinator and host for today's episode. We're excited to have you with us. For a reminder, for those of you out there watching, you can join in on the conversation throughout uh, throughout the conversation today how we, as we talk using Twitter and Facebook using the hashtag Astro Chat. I'll be monitoring both throughout uh, and we wanna see what you have to say. We wanna hear your questions. Uh, they can't get asked unless you post them for us. Um, and as another reminder for those of you that maybe haven't been watching this whole past month, uh, Youth Astronaut is an online community of educators and their students along with scientists from the Center for Astrophysics, all exploring the universe together. Um, educators out there that might be tuning in, you can enroll your students in Youth Astronaut. Um, just check out our website at microobservatory.org and check out the uh, Youth Astronaut link at the bottom of the page. Hopefully some more of you will be joining us in all of these conversations. So speaking of conversations, today we'll be chatting with Sandro Tequila. Thanks for being here with us, Sandro. Hi. <laughs> we're excited to have you. Yeah, um, I'm very excited to be part of that as well. So we're going to be talking in a minute about how galaxies grow, right? Yes, exactly. Wonderful. Uh, but before we dive into how galaxies grow, I thought maybe you could take a minute to tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are in life that you are now studying how galaxies grow. Tell us a little bit about your interests, the things that you studied? Yes, so, um, well, it started for me quite early, so kind of in, in primary school, I was, you know, interested in space and stars, and I, I bought actually a, a small telescope um, and started kind of observing myself, um, trying to figure out what's going on. It took me nearly two years of, you know, figuring out like, oh, this is now a planet and this is the star, and then I, I basically was able, you know, in Switzerland, I, I grew up in Switzerland, so the school system is slightly different. So in order to go to high school, you have to do an entrance exam and only a small part of the population is actually going to high school. And I was lucky to get in. And, and then when I, I finished high school, I, I basically had to think of like, what do I want to study? And I always had like as my, as my kind of hobby, as my, you know, as my, my, my dream passion is basically astrophysics. And so I was like, okay, I'd like to study astronomy. Um, the problem was that there's not really astronomy in Switzerland. It's not that, that, that popular. And, and so what I did was actually physics, because I knew that when you do physics, there is you know, a part of physics that is astrophysics and, and therefore astronomy. And so I, I basically was studying physics. And throughout the years, I always tried to focus as, you know, on, on all the courses I was able to take um, to take ast astronomy related courses. In my bachelor, you know, there was like one course basically. Um, <laughs> but um, with the time, there were more and more courses, and I was able to really, you know, basically follow my passion of astronomy. So I was studying in, in Switzerland. I did, you know, my, my PhD there. And at that time, you know, I, for me, ga galaxies were always very interesting because it's kind of the link between kind of what we know, you know, in our surroundings with the stars and the planets and, and cosmology. It's basically the, the linking bridge. And, and I always in, enjoy not just the, the largest scales cosmology or the smaller scales like the planets, but I, I really like the scale in between. And, and so that's why I was focusing on, on galaxies. And yeah, I was lucky, you know, to until now to basically follow my, my passion. And, you know, I'm, I've been showing, you know, looking at galaxies every day, basically. That's great. That's fantastic. Um, so you actually said something that I don't think we've defined for our audience yet. And they might still be asking this question. Um, We've been talking with people that identify as astronomers and people that identify as astrophysicists. And I don't think anybody for us has defined the difference between what makes astronomy versus astrophysics. Could, could you do that for us? I think nowadays it's basically the, the same. Uh, you know, officially, I think in, in the past astronomer, you know, nomer means like it's, it's more of a naming scheme. So, you know, in the past, astronomy was really a field that was related to classify objects because we didn't know much about the physics. So it was only about classifying objects into nebulae, you know, galaxies, stars, different kinds of stars. And um, so there's all kinds of classification schemes for galaxies, for stars. And, and then with time, you know, there was more and more physics coming in, actually. And, and I think that's why also the, the, the term slightly changed. And um, I would say that nowadays we are all basically astrophysicists because we want to understand the physics of all these astronomical objects. So I would use it interchangeably nowadays, but it has a bit of a, a historical, you okay. know, notation. Absolutely, yeah. And so some people just like the name astronomer because it's easier for people to understand, perhaps. Exactly. Yeah, it's less scary when you say physics is always like whoa, whoa, physics, you know. <laughs> and the astronomer is like, oh yeah, that's actually nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Astronomy, like, oh, I can do that. I look up at the moon. Astrophysics yes, can be exactly. a little intimidating. I think that's a really good yeah. point. Um, 
I think you all made another uh, point that I think could be valuable for perhaps some of our older audience that are in high school thinking about what they want to study in college, um, that you studied physics and not astrophysics in undergrad, and that that's okay. You can still become an astrophysicist later on. I think there's a lot of schools that just like in Switzerland here in the US that maybe don't have astrophysics departments or astronomy departments. Um, yes, yes, I think that, you know, as long, you know, as, as you said, like as if you wanna do research and, and, you know, in any kind of research, but in particular, so astrophysical research, um, you need a broad set of skills and, and, you know, you need to have critical thinking. Um, so you need to, you know, you need to do some programming language, I think, you know, because, you know, in my undergrad, a lot of things are in German. And if you want to research, everything's in English, right? So, you know, there is a broad set of skills, I think, that, that one needs to do. And, you know, there are, it's also in astrophysics, there are, are many different, um, fo you know, different focus. Some people focus much more on the theory side, on mathematics, on, on the very hardcore, you know, theoretical, physical aspects. And then there are people more on the data science part, you know, data analysis part. And so, you know, there are different set of skills also needed. And that's why it's also kind of, you know, you don't need to study just just you know physics or astrophysics in order to do a path in, in research. I think it's 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 quite broad, as long as you know when you when you did your undergrad and you have all this had a big interest, you know that you can always start you know and and picking up skills actually on the way. I think you know also for me, even I'm now um, a postdoc basically, I I still learn every day new things, um, and so I, that's also part of the thing that I enjoy the most actually in my job that I can always learn new set of skills. Um, every day, basically. I think that's a really great point. Um, although we've talked about that uh, this a few times with some of our guests, but if, if some of our viewers today haven't watched those episodes, could you tell us what a postdoc is? Yes. So, um, so basically, in, you know, there is basically kind of a career path in the sense that usually you, you do the undergrads, you do the graduate studies with a PhD. Um, and they are sometimes differently structured in different countries, but this is like the normal path. And then, you know, it, historically, basically, people thought like, oh, actually, it would be nice if you go somewhere else for some years to, to get some research experience from a different place and learn something new. And, and that was basically the postdoc experience before you go back and you get a faculty job. And nowadays, of course, it changed, you know, times have changed. You usually don't go back to home, your home institution, but basically after your PhD, you go to a place or two places um, to do uh, kind of a, you know, additional research experiences. It's basically, you're like a scientist, basically, at that place. You, you work there, um, but you can basically focus most of the time fully on, on science. Sometimes you have to do a little bit of teaching aside if you, if you like to. Um, and then later on, you try to get maybe a permanent job. Um, so you get try, you know, you try to get a professorship somewhere, which, you know, nowadays is not the easiest part in the world, I would say, but, um, at least the postdoc usually is, is, I think, a very valuable experience in the sense that you can really work together with a new set of people and work also on a new set of questions. Okay, than so what you did already in your PhD, basically. Yeah, so it's uh, a chance to learn something different than you would have learned while you were earning your degree. Uh, exactly. And learn from a different group of people before you kind of settle on a more permanent position as a professor or wherever you. Yes, might. and then you can also bring in into that group. You're going usually, you know, some new new things, right? Because you come from a place maybe they haven't heard of before, or, you know, you learn some, as you had some, some other kind of ways to analyze the data, for example, and you bring that into the new group as well. So there is usually quite a, a fruitful exchange of ideas. Uh, and I think that's why postdoc is, is actually a very useful um, thing to do as well. That is very cool. Thank you. Um, so I think we've chatted enough. I think maybe our, our audience might want to hear a little bit about what you are researching and tell us a little bit about your science. Okay, so let me share my screen then. Perfect. Okay, so so how do galaxies grow? So as I said, like I I'm really focusing on on galaxies in my research, and I'm I'm very much fascinated by images such as those actually, where you can see um, you know all kind of different kinds of galaxies. So we can see here galaxies, for example, that are are quite reddish looking. Um, we know that they have, for example, little um, star formations. So there are very few stars formed in these kind of objects. And then we have the so-called star forming galaxies that seem to be much bluer. And you can see basically here in this blue, bluer outskirts, you can see kind of these spiral arm structures. And you can see here sites of, of new star formation. And so this is just like you know one image on the sky. And you can see already here, these are, are kind of two different kinds of galaxies. This galaxy is probably quite similar to that galaxy. It's just viewed 
um, basically edge on. And, and so for me, you know, my, my research really tries to you know, understand why do galaxies today look so diverse? You know, we see galaxies that are large, that are small, that are star forming, that have no star formation. And I'm very curious to understand why. Well, what's the physics behind this? You know, are we discussing here black hole feedback? So for example, you know, we know that there are supermassive black holes in the center of these galaxies. Are these black holes shaping these galaxies? Has it to do with the accretion of gas? Maybe, the, you know, in one galaxy, there is no new gas accretion. Here, there might be still some gas accretion. And, and so I try to figure out, you know, how do these galaxies grow? Why are they so diverse in today's universe? And so, you know, in order to basically map out space, I think we can start with something kind of here on Earth. Um, one thing that I think all of us have kind of experienced is, is, a, is a lightning or, you know, a thunderstorm a bit further away. And, and what we all observe, I think, when we see these thunderstorms is that actually we, we see the flash and the flash seems to be immediately, you know, at our place. And then there is actually some kind of time delay until the, the sound arrives. And this is, of course, because the speed of light is much, much faster than the speed of sound. So if we, you know, if we get to some numbers, we see that light travels actually uh, with nearly 200,000 miles per second. So it's super fast. And because it's so fast, it actually, you know, feels for us instantaneous, right? It's basically when we switch on the light in the room, it basically, you know, the light comes on immediately or the, you know, when we see the thunderstorm, the light arrives at our place immediately. But this is just because the distance between the source of light and us is, is very short. On the other hand, sound is traveling much slower. And that's why there is also this time lag between the light and the sound when we look at the thunderstorm. So the sound roughly travels at 600, you know, like roughly 800 miles per hour or roughly a fifth of a mile per second. And so you can see it's much, much slower. Wow. And that's why we can also that use this. Yes, it's, it's much slower. And that's why we also can use actually that. So we can use this to calculate how far away a thunderstorm is because we can assume that the, basically the light arrived immediately. And then we know that the sound, you know, that is associated to this flash, actually, you know, we can just measure the time in seconds and divide by five and come roughly to the distance in miles. So this means that we can really estimate the, the distance to a thunderstorm, um, you know, quite accurately with, with, this simple, with this simple thought. Now, because these systems in space are much larger, we can actually measure, you know, uh, we can actually use light as a, as a measurable for distances. And I'm sure you are all are familiar with the Earth and the Moon. Um, and so when we have the distance to the Moon, you know, this is roughly actually, um, you know, when we measure it in, in miles now again, it's roughly 240,000 miles. And so this is already quite much. So you see like this is the closest object right in space. And so we already need, you know, 100,000 miles to express the distance. And that's why astronomers come up with this distance measure of, of its light units basically. And you, you have seen before that, you know, this roughly takes the light one second to travel, right? It takes about a second from the moon um, to travel to earth. And because this is the, you know, light is basically the fastest thing in, um, in the universe, we know that every signal needs at least you know, that much time to travel. So if you have, for example, somebody on the moon and talks into a, a walkie-talkie, right, then we would you know, get this signal on Earth, it will be always uh, delayed by, by a second. And now we can go further out and we can basically the, put the moon next to the Earth and, and put the sun here. Now this is not to scale. So the, the Earth is actually in comparison to the sun much, much smaller. You can look at this region here. I just put on the Earth there. You see the Earth now appearing? So this yeah. is roughly the size of the Earth, right? So the Earth has roughly 110 times, you know, you can put 110 Earths in the diameter of the Sun. Okay, so the Sun is much, much larger than the Earth. Now, it seems to be kind of similar size as the Moon, but this is just because the Sun is much, much further away than the Moon from the Earth. And so if we, again, put some, some numbers on this, we actually, you know, have here already, we talked already about millions of miles, so it's nearly 100 million miles away. And, you know, now already the sun, you know, from the light takes about eight light minutes to travel from the sun to earth. And again, this means if the sun basically would explode now, it would take eight minutes until we actually know of that. And so it's just every, every signal takes at least eight minutes from the sun to travel to us. And, and I'm sure most of you have seen already, the, you know, the, the stars in the night sky. If you go to a very dark place, what you can also see is this this milky band here, right? And this is actually our own galaxy, okay? So these are basically, you know, what you can see here in front are, are the stars, 
that are within the solar neighborhood, so kind of close to us. And then you can see all of, of these kind of more milky structures. These are also stars, but they are so far away that it's, it's basically hard to, to see them individually. And so they kind of you know, appear in this kind of milky pattern. And then you can also see some dust lanes here. So there is in our galaxy, not just stars, but there is also gas and dust. And, and that you can, that's what you can see here basically in the central part. And so this here is basically roughly the center of the Milky Way. So this is the center of our own galaxy. And up here, this bright thing, if you have warned, this is actually Jupiter. So this is a, it's a planet actually in the solar system. But all of the other objects here are actually stars. Wow. So when if you, you say that's the center, yes. or are you going to tell us with this image? I can tell you also. Why, it depends what your question is. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you were talking earlier, you showed us the disk of a galaxy. And I, so I think maybe your next image might help. Um, when yeah. you say that's the center, we're looking towards that bright spot in the middle, right? Yes. OK. So exactly. our galaxy so, is flatter. Exactly. So we, have, we, we believe that we live in something like such a galaxy, like a disk galaxy. Now, we cannot really leave our own galaxy with the technology at the moment. So I, I show you a picture here of our neighboring galaxy, the, the Andromeda galaxy. But we believe that the Milky Way galaxy is somehow similar. So it's also still star forming. It has a disk. And the sun is basically a star somewhere here in the outskirts. OK, so that's a typical average star, I would say. It's not like super big or super small. Um, it's, it's a typical star in the outskirts of, 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 our own, of our own galaxy, of the Milky Way. And so if you now go into understand, basically, we see that, you know, that the, all the stars, they move actually around this center, OK? And they, they move actually quite quickly. And what, you know, let's put on some number again. So here, um, I expressed this already with light years. Okay, so it, it takes, if, you know, the light from the center here, um, roughly 20, uh, 25,000 years to reach us. And so the distance from the sun to the center of our own galaxy is roughly 25,000 light years. Now, if you ask me to put this down in miles, you know, this would be the number. <laughs> and that's why you see that only already within our own galaxy, I think we, we have to give up basically miles as a, as a measure or kilometers. Um, so we basically, you know, go into to light years. And, and so, you know, the, the sun is traveling around the center of the Milky Way and it, it moves actually with, you know, quite quickly, roughly with 200 kilometers per second. So it, it's, it's, it's quite, you know, quickly moving around the central part of our, of our own galaxy. But um, yeah, and so you can see already from this kind of image that the galaxies are, are quite complicated objects. Now, because this is not our own galaxy, when we take this image, we basically take a picture out of our own galaxy. And so all these stars here that you can see, these are part of our own galaxy. So these are kind of foreground stars that are sitting in our own galaxy. And the stars here in this image are not really resolved. So you can see that all these Milky structure are actually stars that belong to this, um, this other galaxy. Okay, so and, when we're looking at images yeah. of objects that are outside of our own galaxy, Often when we see stars in the field, those are stars that are actually within our galaxy, kind of in front of whatever we're looking at behind it. Exactly, yeah. So the, the, the stars that you know, the individual stars that you can see here resolve basically. Some of them are maybe also galaxies that are really far away, but most of them are actually stars um, that belong to our own galaxy, exactly. Oh. And, and so that's why I will to try to, you know, image galaxies that are maybe not within the plane of our own galaxy, but actually above or below the plane, so that we have very few of these, these stars in the field. Because we, we try to image galaxies and not stars, right? Of course, uh, the people who st study stars, they would like to see more stars. <laughs> so there is always a bit of competition there. Um, so um, we look at these kind of images, and you can immediately see that, as I said before, that the star, you know, it's not just stars that you know, a galaxy is made of, but actually also gas, dust, and something else that we figured out is actually dark matter. And I'm sure you have heard of dark matter before. And, and one indication of dark matter is actually coming from measuring the rotation of stars and the gas within galaxies. And so this is now you know, a galaxy. And we can basically measure how quickly um, stars and the gas is rotating around the center of the galaxy. And, and we can measure the distance out to the outskirts. And I said, like, the sun is somewhere you know, around here, maybe. Um, but we can measure this further out with just uh, the gas, because we don't see this here, but there is some gas around here. Now, if we measure all of the, you know, all of the light, all of the, of the gas, we basically would come up with, with something like this. We would expect that the, the rotational velocity, so the, the how quickly the stars move around the center of this galaxy, could move, go up and then decline again. 
um, according to basically this equation here, you know, which just comes out basically from, from simple um, um, Newtonian um, gravity, which basically says then that we have basically, you know, that the velocity should be roughly proportional to the, to the mass enclosed. Now, if we go and measure this, we actually measure something else. So we measure that the stars here, you know, as expected, move always quicker and quicker the further you go out. But then at some point, you basically see that actually, you know, instead of this decline, you actually see that um, the, the rotation of the gas and the stars in the outskirts is much, much faster. And this means that there is more mass than we actually see. And this is, you know, what we usually uh, refer to as, as dark matter. So galaxies um, are consisting of stars, gas, um, and so on, but they also actually sit within a so-called dark matter halo, okay? So they basically sit um, within uh, a structure that we really cannot see by eye, but it somehow has a, you know, a gravitational attraction and, and galaxies basically sit in the central part of these objects. And we call these you know, dark matter halos um, that consist of, of dark matter. Now there have been other you know, observational evidences for dark matter, and I'm sure you have heard of them because come also from, you know, basically from cosmological origin. So if you look at the, for example, the you know, cosmic microwave background, and so it's quite neat that actually, you know, some very different measures, uh, measurements from the early universe point to uh, a contribution to um, the dark, you know, the contribution of, the, of, of matter coming from dark matter. And it's the same amount that we basically need to explain the rotation of galaxies as we need to explain um, observations in the early universe. And that's why the, you know, the, the concept of dark, dark matter is, is, um, has a lot of support. Cool. Could you go back uh, for just a second? I just want to yes. clarify for our audience. Um, just maybe reiterate for us why the speed would be different at the center towards the edge of a galaxy if there wasn't dark matter. Can I really reiterate that for us? Yeah, so it, it has really to do of, of how much matter you have enclosed. So you can think of the following, right? So if you have, let's say you have, you know, we can think of the, 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 the planet system, right? So you have the sun and you have the earth, right? So we know that the earth is moving around the sun. Now, what happens if you make the, the sun more massive? Let's say you just, you know, increase the mass by a factor of 100. If you would keep the, the velocity of the planet the same, what would happen is that the planet would just, you know, fall into the, you know, it would basically circle in, right? So what you need to do in order to keep the planet on, on the same trajectory, you need to increase its velocity so that it keeps, you know, being in the outskirt. Otherwise, it would just fall in because the gravitational force would be too strong. And so you see basically there is a link between how much mass you have and what the velocity is of, of the object, you know, of, 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 a, of, a, of, a, of a star or of a planet in the outskirt. And so basically this, because we have here less and less mass, um, you know, contributing to a, a radial, you know, bin in the outskirts, you basically would expect that the velocity should decrease as one over r roughly. And on the other hand, if we, if, if we, what we measure is, is much more mass here. Okay, we see much higher velocity and that means that you basically have more mass than you actually see. So this is expected based on the light, which means the stars as well as the gas. But what we really observe is something much flatter. So this flat velocity curve basically, you know, shows that there must be more mass than what we would, what that we actually see. Okay, thanks. That helps. Yeah, I mean, like you can write down equations, and then it will naturally come out this this kind of equation. Right? Um, but it's basically putting, you know, the gravitational force to the centrifugal force. Okay. Um, yeah, and if any of our audience has ever been at a science center, even sometimes in malls, they have those. Um, those kind of tubes where you can spin a, a ball bearing around it, right? The funnels and watch it slowly yes. circle into the center as it loses velocity or speed. Yes, exactly. So those, you can imagine in those cases, you know, that's basically the, the gravitational potential, right? So if you would increase the mass, what you will do is actually, you will make this deeper and deeper, you know, and so it would be steeper. And so in order to basically rotate for a longer time, you need to have a higher velocity, right? Perfect, yeah. And so now, you know, beyond the galaxy, beyond the Milky Way, it's not, not, not finished, right? The Milky Way, as you said, there is another galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy, which is our neighboring galaxy, but there are even many more neighboring galaxies that are, are much smaller. And so what I show you here is basically the local group of galaxies. So this is the Milky Way galaxy. It's kind of sitting here. And then you have many smaller galaxies. We have the large and the small Magellanic cloud. Those actually you can see by eye when you're in the southern hemisphere. And then you can also 
you know, um, see other smaller objects um, orbiting the, our own Milky Way. And the other galaxy I've shown you before, this is Andromeda galaxy, also sometimes called M31. And, and this object is actually here. And it's part of our local group. Um, you can see that, you know, this has also its own neighbors, but it's sitting, you know, a bit further out uh, away from us. And so we both have our own basically dark matter halos. And the distance between us is now already 2.5 million light years. And so this really means that if when you observe, you know, Andromeda galaxy, you're actually looking 2.5 million years into the past, right? Because the, the light takes 2.5 million years to travel to us. And so we can, of course, not resolve, you know, dinosaurs or planets in these other objects. But basically, we would really, what we see now, if you take an image today of Andromeda, we would actually see it, how it looked 2.5 million light years in the past. And so we can use this actually to probe the early universe, right? So with very powerful telescopes, we can go now and look at objects that are even further away. And if you want to understand how galaxies form and evolve, you can just observe galaxies at early and earlier times. And basically, uh, because light, you know, the light needs time to travel to us, we basically can use this to probe the distant past. And so I've been using a lot um, the very large telescope, which is in Chile. These are actually four, um, four telescopes, and they all have different science instruments on them. And I just show you here, you know, the mirror of one of those. Okay, so these are roughly eight meters. You can see here a human, um, you know, as a comparison. And what happens, so in these telescopes, we have these large mirrors, and we want to build large mirrors because we want to collect more light. It's basically the same thing with your eyes, right? So if you go into a, a dark room, um, and then you, you know, what, what happens is that your pupils will get larger and larger because you want to basically get more and more light. And so what, you, what happens here is basically that we can collect light onto a, a small CCD um, um, of, of the size of this. So basically what, we, what happens is that the light comes in, gets reflected on this mirror, gets reflected on this secondary mirror, which is here on the top, and then gets reflected back down through this hole. And then on the bottom, basically, we put our instruments. It can be spectrographs or, or just cameras, basically. And we can use this to take then images uh, as well as you know, spectra of, of far distant galaxies. Now, one issue of these telescopes is that there is this atmosphere, right? So we all know that we want to build telescopes um, in, in high mountains um, where there is little atmosphere, little light pollution. But still, even if you build them on top of mountains um, on 4,000 meters or higher, we still have the issue that there is some atmosphere. And the atmosphere, what it does is basically, it, it, you know, it has some turbulence. And, and basically, when the, the light is arriving, it jiggles around the light. So we cannot make very sharp images. We basically are affected by by the so-called seeing, by the atmosphere blurring the images. And so of course, what, you know, what we would like to do is we want to go to space outside of our own atmosphere. And this is what you know, has been done uh, with the Hubble Space Telescope, right? So the Hubble Space Telescope is actually smaller than this. It's, it's only roughly um, 2.5 meters in diameter, so roughly this size here. But it's, it's very powerful because it's in space. And so we don't have to worry about the atmosphere. It's, 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 it's high above the atmosphere. And so you can make very, very sharp images. And, and the Hubble Space Telescope has been launched now over you know, 30 years ago, actually. So it has just had its birthday last, last, last Friday. So we can look you know, up what the, the birthday image was. But you know, basically, this, the, telescope is, is, the telescope is quite old. But thanks to the, you know, the space shuttle missions, we were able to actually go up and replace some of the instrumentation so that still nowadays, actually, it has um, very good cameras on it with which we can make great images. And one of the most famous image, um, which just maybe as a comparison, so you know, with the resolution, so what, what, you know, how sharp of an image can Hubble make? And um, we usually call it, you know, we measure this in arc seconds. So we say 0.1 point, point arc second. Um, now this is hard to imagine what that means, but this basically means that if we put a car, and you can see here, sorry, now this is maybe just go go back. So you can see here on the top of the car, and it has, you know, these two front lights. Imagine we put the car. You know, to Hawaii, for example, and now observe it from Boston. Okay, so this is roughly five to six thousand miles. Um, Hubble will easily be able to tell apart the two front lights, basically. So this wow. is the resolution Hubble has. Now, of course, the Earth is curved and so on, but you know, imagine that you know there's no curvature and we can just see through the Earth. But this is basically the resolution that Hubble has. So we are able to tell apart, you know, the front light of a car that sits about six thousand miles away from us, and that's why Hubble is used to take images of very distant galaxies because. Thanks to Hubble, we can basically understand um, how the centers of the outskirts look different. And I'll show you some images in, you know, in no time afterwards. Yeah. That's One of the most famous, yes? So that's incredible. 
yeah, it's 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 pretty cool, right? Um, and it's 30 years old already, right? Um, and the technology, a lot of it has been developed even before that, of course. Um, and so this is one of the most famous images, probably. This is the um, Abu Ghid field. Um, so this is basically a region that has been chosen to be known for nothing. So that was just like a dark spot uh, where nothing has been seen before. We we thought that you know it's empty. And so Hubble has been looking at it for several days actually, and has collected just photons from it. And then when we have looked at the images, you can see what happens, right? This is this is what came out, and you can see actually thousands of galaxies here. There's roughly uh, roughly five to six thousand galaxies, maybe even more. It's roughly ten thousand galaxies in this image, and and you can see a lot of you know these spiral galaxies, um, the more elliptical galaxies, and then you can see smaller and smaller objects. So basically, everything here is a galaxy, except there are roughly two stars. There is one star up here, and another star down here. And you can see these are stars. You can see they have these you know, diffraction spikes here. Um, but otherwise, everything is a galaxy, basically. And you can see that there are many different kinds of galaxies, right? Some of them, even close by, um, look very different. But even when you go to, you know, to more distant objects that seem to be much smaller, they seem to have quite different colors. So some objects are very red. For example, you know, here you can see quite a red dot. You can see here quite a red dot. And then you can see some smaller bluer ones. And, and usually, typically, the redder ones are the ones that are actually further away because of redshifting. Um, and we can discuss this more if you're interested. But basically, the objects that are further away seem to be overall redder. Now, from, you know, from images such as those, we were able to actually understand how many galaxies there are and how many new stars there are forming. So we can go and now we can measure uh, you know, how, how many stars such, such a galaxy typically can make. So we measure basically how many new solar masses per year, so how many typical solar mass stars does such an object make? And so we can plot something like this. This is the, the star formation rate density or the star formation per unit volume. So this is really how many new stars do you make per year in a given volume as a function of time. So you can think of here, you know, today. Okay, so this is the time since the Big Bang. So, you know, when the universe started, there was the Big Bang. And then time, you know, progressed. And, you know, we know that today's universe is roughly 13.8 uh, billion years old. And, and so basically we are observing everything into the past and we basically are able to map out how many new stars have been formed over you know, the time in the universe. And this is roughly the curve we get. So you can see that early times there was little star formation and then the first galaxies assembled, the first stars formed, and then quickly actually the star formation rate went quite quickly up. So we can see that you know, in this epoch here, roughly two to six, uh, billion years after Big Bang, most of the stars have actually formed in the universe. Okay, so the sun, we know it, its age is roughly five million year, uh, five billion years. So you know it's roughly formed around here, but most of the other stars, you know, um, especially lower mass stars, formed much earlier. And so they all formed in this peak here at, at early times. And and so from you know my research is, is is really focusing basically on this peak here. I really try to understand why are are the star you know why are the galaxies forming many more stars. In the past, and you can see that today there are fewer and fewer stars formed, and we try to understand why is that the case? Why do suddenly get you know many galaxies stop forming stars? Why do overall galaxies have less um, star formation in them? Um, are we going to be soon a very dark universe, or or is it kind of reigniting at some point, right? But it seems at the moment at least everything points to a downward trend. And so in my in Getting my research, less stars. Exactly. So all those galaxies, you know, most of the galaxies in the universe have a declining star formation rate. So they have a declining star formation activity. And some galaxies that we have seen in the first image, you see that there was this galaxy that had basically no star formation, right? So there are these galaxies that seem to have stopped their star formation altogether. And, and we try to figure out why do these galaxies basically die? Why do they fo stop forming stars? And, and so, you know, I hope that we can find some clues um, to answer these questions by studying these these galaxies actually at early times and they're still were forming stars, right? We can basically see that today there are many galaxies that have little star formation. We can go back in time and, and see those galaxies still being active, right? Being, star, you know, heavily star forming and, and trying to figure out what was the physics going on there, you know, that suddenly stopped the star formation. Okay, so this is still something that I need to, yeah. Okay, so early, you know, so early galaxies are clumpy. So, uh, you know, when I looked at these images, uh, you know, some years back, you see that these galaxies look very clumpy. So they are looking quite different. So these are images now with the Hubble Space Telescope. These galaxies are roughly 10 billion years in the past. So these are, we call it the redshift two. 
So this, these galaxies, you see them roughly three billion years after the Big Bang. And we can see them you know, now because they are so far away that the light needed roughly 10 billion years to travel to us. And now we are you know, putting up Hubble and we are basically collecting that light, right? And you can see that you actually not just observe them in one wavelength, we observe them in several different wavelengths to understand where are the young and where the old stars are. We can see here again, these are you know, kind of color images. Now, these are not as nice as you know, you're used to, I guess, from Hubble usually, but you know, this is pretty cool um, because we can basically see there are these centers that seem to be quite red. And then we have the outskirts and you can see there is some bluer clumps, right? Yeah. You can see here there are some bluer structures in the outskirts. And before, you know, I mean, like a lot of, you know, we have always assumed, well, this is maybe because um, we have a lot of more galaxy collisions, okay? So galaxy collisions, we see them also in today's universe are quite rare, but we see that galaxies, you know, they basically come together. Now, this is not one galaxy merger of the same pair. These are many different galaxies observed because the, the time scale for merging galaxies takes, takes you know, uh, many, many milli uh, hundreds of million years, right? So we basically cannot observe one single galaxy pair to merge, but these are, you know, basically uh, kind of a merger sequence. Um, observing different different pairs of galaxies. And you can see that when they merge together, they can look quite clumpy. And, and also what happens is that, you know, here the star formation is actually quite low and the star formation here is much higher. Hmm. And, and so then, you know, the idea was, that, oh, maybe at early times, the galaxies are much clumpier. Maybe all of those galaxies are actually merging together, right? And they form these, they have these high star formation rates because they are all merging together. And, and this explains the high star formation rate, it explains this clumpy structure. But actually, that's not what we see. Um, the nice thing is that we are able now um, to get also the kinematics of the gas. So we can basically, uh, with ground-based uh, integral field unit spectroscopy, so what this does basically is take a spectrum for each um, pixel you have in your image. We can basically track animation lines, you know, like each alpha here, and we can measure um, the rotation of the ionized gas in these galaxies. And what you can see is actually there is a lot of nice rotation in these objects. So these objects here, they seem to be actually nicely rotating. Okay, so these don't seem to be in a merger state where we would expect, um, you know, when you look at here, the, the kinematics would be very chaotic, right? So it, it will look all over the place. But what we see here is actually a lot of nice rotation. And so now what we believe is that these galaxies are actually um, not merging, but those galaxies at early times are, they are actually just accreting gas at much higher rate. Okay, they're accreting gas you know, maybe 10 to 100 times more gas in the same amount of time. And they do this and the gas usually, you know, happens up in a, in a rotating disk kind of configuration. And, and because there's so much gas, there's a lot, of, um, a lot of star formation taking place, sometimes also in these giant clumps that we can see. Um, so I'm gonna ask you to clarify a few terms that you used for us there. Yes. Um, so you use the word kinematics. Yes. Could you define that for us? Yeah, so kinematics is really, you know, figuring out why we can see a certain velocity structure. So what we see here is, as you can see here in blue, is basically gas that is moving towards us. Now these are roughly 200 kilometers per second, and and the red part is moving away from us. And we try to figure out why we see this velocity, right? And the kinematics, you know, tells us basically that this has to do with a with a rotating disk-like component. And so you can see basically we we see this rotation. And, and this tells us that the gas seems to be, you know, moving around in, in kind of a radial-like orbit. So really just the movement of what's yes. happening in that galaxy. How exactly. is it moving? Okay, great. Um, and so what you're saying is part of it's moving closer to us, part of it's moving farther away based on what we see in the light. Yes. Okay. And then you use the word accretion. Could you just define accretion for us too? Yes, okay. So. Um, so basically like all galaxies that have some star formation, they need to replenish the gas. We can think of like, you know, you, you form some stars and the gas gets basically consumed into stars and also some gas will be blown out from the galaxy. But basically, you know, if, if we don't have new gas falling in or accrete onto the galaxy, the galaxy will immediately run out of fuel, you know, for new stars, right? They will run out of gas and therefore have no star, you know, new, new fuel for star formation. And, and so in these, uh, in these galaxies, what we live to see is that they, these galaxies have much higher accretion rate. So they accrete uh, much more gas, fresh gas, so they can have a much higher star formation. Basically. So pull in or like gather gas. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Okay, great. 
that's so cool. So these are not galaxies moving together like they kind of that clumpy look that it appears, but actually singular galaxies rotating and just pulling in more stuff and moving in yes. a way that we weren't expecting. Yes, now we have also examples that we see clear mergers. I, mean, that they, I just show you here four of, of the galaxies that seem to be rotating, but there are, we have a few objects and I would say roughly a third that also seem to be have a clear merger signature. So it's not that you know, there will be no mergers at early times. There will be of course mergers, but it's not that all the, the galaxies at early times are, are having high star formation rates because of mergers basically. Very cool. Okay, because of galaxy collisions. And, and so another thing that is very useful, I think is, you know, to understand is, you know, the, let's say to, to understand the physics better. Um, now, let me just try to see if the, the movie is playing. Yes, it's basically looking at uh, numerical simulations. So what we can do is in order to understand, you know, the, the internal physics of galaxies better is, is, is trying to put simple recipes for star formation for you know, stellar explosions, for feedback from black holes. So all the physics we believe that is important to shape galaxies, we can put it them into the computer. And what I show you here is, is a simulation called um, Illustris TNG. This simulation actually has been you know, developed and run um, you know, also here at, at the Center for Astrophysics. And what you can see is basically the gas. And you can see how at early times, you know, this stretch of two, this is exactly the epoch I showed you the images before, how gas accretes onto these galaxies. So this is now run just in the computer, uh, but you can see how a lot of gas gets accreted onto this galaxy and there is not really much merger. So you see like now there is a merger coming in here, another object, another galaxy, but you can see that the galaxy actually has, you know, kind of a nicely rotating disc. And over here, I can see also what the metallicity of the gas is. So how many, you know, what the element structure is in the gas. But you basically can see that, you know, that there is a lot of gas fueling into these systems and, you know, explaining the rather high star formation rates. And what you see here is basically the stellar structure. So here's the stellar component in the bottom right, zooming in just on the central part. And you can see that you can make these nicely rotating disks already at, at quite early times. And so these simulations help us to make predictions that we can go and in observations to, to test basically and try to figure out how important certain physical mechanisms are um, in, in shaping these galaxies. And so, you know, to, to wrap up, um, so I'm very excited about the future, of course. Um, now, you know, we, I've talked to you, you know, I showed you images from the Hubble Space Telescope, um, but actually very soon in the next, um, you know, one or two years, there will be actually a new telescope launched, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, JWST. And, you know, I can see already, this is another telescope we put actually out in space. And it's significantly larger. And um, you can see here the mirror size, right? So HST, the Hubble, Hubble Space Telescope had roughly 2.4 meters. JWST will, you know, be more than double in size. And, and in addition to the larger mirror size, we can collect more light, but it can also look at different wavelengths. So you can see the Hubble Space Telescope is able to look at roughly around one micron. So you can see the visual light that we see with our eyes. But it can also go up to you know something like the near infrared, which is roughly 1.6 micron. The nice thing with JWST you can look at even you know redder light. Okay, it can go up to you know 100 micron. This will help us basically uh, to to look at um, galaxies are even further away and to bas basically study the physical um, ingredients in those earlier galaxies because we because we know that when galaxies are further away, they're also you know older spectrum gets shifted to the red. And so we need, uh, you know, better capabilities in this, this infrared bands and JWC will provide those to us. And so this will be launching in the next one or two years. And, you know, we will learn a lot about the galaxies beyond what I've shown you before, okay? So now we have seen a lot of nice science results up to roughly 10 billion years in the past. So JWC will really be able to probe um, to the first galaxies basically in the universe. That. And even further in the future, you know, we will actually um, have even larger telescopes on the ground. We talk here of something you know, around 20 to 40 meters on the ground. You can just see here, this is the, the GMP. So this is also um, part of where the, the, the Center for Astrophysics is involved. You can see here, this is the, the mirror. So these are like, you know, I showed you before an, an image of one of the mirrors, right? So these are um, basically, um, you know, seven of those, right? together. And you can see here, it's just a truck as a comparison. <laughs> These next generation telescopes will, are actually currently being built and it will be finished within the next, um, you know, six to 10 years. And 
those telescopes will really help us to zoom in on, on, on basically details in these galaxies at early time. So we'll be able to, to map out the central parts and the outskirts in much greater detail than we have been able to do with Hubble and even with the, the, James, you know, the James Webb Space Telescope. So this is the, the future and of course we're excited because we'll be able to learn much more on the, the details um, of internal structures of galaxies as we are able to see in the local universe also at, at earlier present times. So that's it, what I prepared, you know, for, for slides at the moment. Fantastic. I'm always happy to answer all kinds of questions. Yeah, we've got some questions that have come in. Um, let's see. So we've got a question about dark energy that you were talking about at the beginning and how that plays into the role in development of galaxies. Uh, so the question is, what role does dark energy or dark matter uh, play in the development of a galaxy? Do they create and mold them into their shapes, elliptical, spiral, kind of the different shapes that you were talking about? Um, or is there some other role that they play? Yes, yeah, so, so dark matter. Um, you know, there's a difference between dark energy and dark matter, right? So, um, so dark matter is, is playing, in, you know, a very important role for shaping galaxies. Um, dark energy is, is, is um, basically acting more on the larger scales um, in recent times, basically with the expansion rate of the universe. There's also an effect on, on galaxies, but um, a much more smaller and detailed effect. So I, let me focus more on the, the dark matter part. Um, so the dark, so in, you know, basically, as I said, like we know that galaxies are embedded within so-called dark matter halos. So what happens actually is that the dark matter halos forming first. So we, we know that you know there are these over densities in the early universe that are related to, to the dark matter structure, basically. You can think of like the backbone of the universe is, is made out of these dark matter halos, where then gas, the baryons, are accreting onto and forming the galaxies in the centers of these dark matter halos. And so dark matter makes it really possible for the baryons to basically, you know, um, find these over densities and, and fall into and, and, and form galaxies in them. And, and you can see that basically, if you have a, a, you know, a, a very massive dark matter halo that's formed very early, you will also form a galaxy at early times. Whereas when you have dark matter halos that form rather late, you will form galaxies rather late. And so galaxies will tell us something of what kind of dark matter halos you know, uh, form at which time, basically. And so you can use actually galaxies in some sense also to probe, um, you know, the dark matter in, in that regard. You can think of like different kinds of dark matter malos and dark matter, um, you know, formation mechanisms um, give you different imprints on the dark matter halo population, therefore also on the galaxy population. Now galaxies are very complicated structures because they have a lot of different physics going on. You know, we have gas cooling, we have feedback from stars, we have exploding stars, we have black holes. And because all of that, the baryonic physics is, is, is very complicated. So all the physics that is related to the gas and the stars is, is quite complicated and very rich. And that makes, you know, the, the imprint of the dark matter more diffuse. And so it's hard to tell apart. But for sure, you know, what we see is that galaxies that form in, in more massive dark matter halos are usually older and more quiescent than galaxies that formed in, in younger dark matter halos. Very in that cool. sense. So we have basically, you know, you can basically see that in, in massive clusters, there are usually these, these bright elliptical galaxies. And we know that those objects, so these dark matter halos, um, you know, formed, you know, basically at the highest over densities at, at early times. Wow, very cool. Uh, so you mentioned something in that description of what's inside galaxies being one thing being black holes. Um, and I think a lot of us have heard that there's a black hole at the center of every galaxy. Um, and so another question that's coming is, is, do galaxies require a black hole to form? Do galaxies require a black hole to form? I mean, do you mean like a black hole? So galaxies can form even without black holes, okay? So, so no. we don't... <laughs> No, no, it's not that, you know, a black hole forms and then, oh yeah, the galaxy forms around it. Now, we don't exactly know how these massive black holes form the center of these galaxies, but their, you know, their impact onto the galaxy, for example, for, for, from a gravitational point of view, is not major. So, you know, like if you look at how, what the gravitational influences of a black hole with respect to the galaxy, it's not that the stars in the outskirts of a galaxy feel the attraction of the black hole. And that's why they are orbiting around the center of the galaxy. It's really the stars that make up the gravitational potential in the central part. And the black hole, if you take it away, our Milky Way will not really care in the sense that, you know, there will be still stars orbiting basically with the same orbit. 
it's only within the very central part of a galaxy that the black hole is able to shape the orbits of, of the stars. Now, it doesn't mean that the black hole has no impact on the overall galaxy. As I said, I think one of the key uncertainties at the moment is we don't really understand the physics that, that, that basically seizes, you know, switches off the star formation in some of the galaxies. And the, one of the leading theories is actually, is actually that the, um, the black hole plays a crucial role by heating up the gas in the halo. And so when you think about that, that when you black, 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 black hole accretes mass, it, it also puts out a lot of um, energy, basically. And, and this energy can heat the gas in the dark matter halo. And so basically then, um, you know, decreases the gas accretion, you know, the fresh gas accreting onto the galaxy. And therefore, basically, it will reduce, um, the, 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 you know, the available, you know, fresh gas for star formation. And that could be a reason why we see usually quite massive black holes in the center of massive ellipticals, you know, because they might have be able to switch off, off the star formation. Now, we still need to find, you know, more observational evidence for that, as well as the, the theoretical understanding of, of, of how this works is not very, you know, it's not very well worked out. And the main issue is that, the, you know, the scales, right? The black hole is a very compact, you know, object. And, um, you know, when you think about galaxy scale, very small. And, and, you know, for us to understand how the gas accretes from the dark matter halo, which acts not just, uh, you know, on, on a few miles, right? It's, it's, it's thousands, you know, hundred thousands of light years, um, how this acts, you know, how this gas cools, accretes, goes in the galaxy from stars, but also some gas going all down to the central part of the galaxies. Uh, and then, you know, on a, on a few kilometers, basically accreting onto a black hole and how this then drives a jet and all of these scales, you know, how they're interacting with each other is, 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 is a very tough problem. And computers, even though they are very powerful nowadays, are not really able to resolve all of these scales. And there, it will also probably not happen in the next, you know, tens or so years, right? So it's it's really tough to from a from a numerical perspective to um, to basically you know to to put in all the physics we believe we know and and then we we run it, right? It's it's a matter of, of of scale we can focus on. We can focus on a certain scale at the moment and understand the physics there. But putting all these scales together is is, is really difficult. And I think observations need to lead um, a little bit there. So we have to really do detailed observations of the small scales and the larger scales and see how they are playing together, basically. Okay. So are you hopeful that some of these new instruments that you're talking about will be able to help us better understand that? Yes, exactly. So at the early times, you have certain kinds of feedback mechanisms or you know different kinds of physics playing out. And so you can basically constrain that maybe with some early galaxy evolution. And, and then the spatial resolution really helped to, to differentiate, um, you know, how many new stars are forming and what kind of configuration are they forming? Are they forming all in one blob or we have seen these clumps, you know, are these clumps really individual clumps or are they made of many smaller clumps, right? So we, we don't really know um, if they would be made out of smaller clumps. What does that mean for the, the star formation physics and, and also feedback physics of the stars? So that there are all these, these un uncertainties that we currently don't know. Yeah. Very cool. I just learned a lot right there. <laughs> um, let's see, we got just a couple more minutes. Um, you know what, actually, because we're closing in on the end, I want to ask you a couple more questions about yourself. Um, it's almost the end of the hour here. Uh, we talked a little bit about your pathway, the classes that you took in college, kind of the things you studied. Um, one of the things I've been asking our visitors is, was there ever a time while you were studying any of the physics or even in, or as early as high school uh, or even middle school, were there any classes that you struggled with that you kind of were like, oh, I don't know if science is for me because I'm struggling with this class or even the opposite of that, if there were any that you loved? Um, so, I say like astronomy was for me always part of my like heart, let's say, you know, I was always very passionate about astronomy. And so when I had like classes that I didn't really, you know, like, or I had to take them, um, like I was, you know, having, I knew that, you know, the long-term goal is basically to, to be able to do astronomy. And I always had this outreach component in my life. So I was always happy to go up to the observatory, basically in my neighborhood and observe the sky, which really puts stuff into perspective, let's say. So even if I had like a hard time at school or, you know, I, I always was able to, to get over that with, with, with that, I would say. Um, 
I mean, throughout the, the classes, I think there were always better and, and worse classes, I think. Um, I enjoy classes usually that are, are quite mathematical and physical, like, you know, um, and, and so I, I just enjoyed, you know, uh, having a team also, you know, like other students with whom I could share ideas and thoughts. Some of the classes are pretty hard, you know, when you have just to go through the course of yourself. And so, you know, having a small group of, of other students and peers with whom you can, you know, thought, think, think through the details again, and exchange ideas and have you know also prepared questions and you know like hey we didn't have actually nobody understood that um you know that that helped a lot actually um so i always enjoy working with with other you know students um in in that regard so um you know i had i had many classes that i didn't was was not overall that interesting i would say um but um i must say that most of them you know i was able to get through somehow i would say yeah no, that's great. I, and I think that's a really good point of finding other classmates that you can check in with. Um, you know, sometimes you, you think you're the only one that doesn't understand something and then you talk to someone finally and you realize, wait, none of us got this. Let's ask again. Let's have somebody uh, explain it in a different way. Yes. And they say like science is not really what you, you know, what you just learn at in your classes. You see, science is really much more than that, I think. And that's why I wouldn't equate science with just what you learn in, in classes. I, for me, at least, if I would have just seen physics and, and I was like, oh, now I should do um, research, I would be like, um, no, you know, like I knew that there is more to, you know, to astronomy than what I learned in classes. Otherwise, I wouldn't have chosen that field, I think. So I think if you have an interest in something, you know, just, you know, just check it out by yourself. There's so much stuff on the internet nowadays and you can find maybe other people in, in you know, in, in other communities that have similar interests. And you will see that there's much more than what you're just learning in your, your you know, textbook or whatever. And I think putting this into perspective that, oh yes, there is more to that. And if you have this kind of more like long-term goal, it also helps to learn for classes, things that you think like are important. So I had classes that I was like, okay, that is kind of cool and interesting because I knew that this is something that I can apply to astronomy or astrophysics in the long-term. And then there are other things that I, I just didn't study that much just because I knew that I would not need them probably that much. And of course, it was kind of a risky thing because, you know, you don't know what's what's going to happen at the end in the exam and so on. But for me, at least, I was super motivated for some parts and I tried to focus on those. And then I was able to actually get up some of the other parts as well through that. So I could motivate myself through parts of, 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 the, of the coursework, let's say, and, and other parts, I, I kind of said, OK, these are probably important as well in, you know, with respect to that thing that I'm very interested in. Mm -hmm. Kind of finding that way to convince yourself that they were valuable because they helped you study something more than yes that. exactly yeah and sometimes it's hard to see that these links you know yeah. but you might be able to talk with other people and they will tell you like hey actually that that's an know that's for some an equation you say like oh i you know they took me like you know a week to understand or like that equation takes forever to drive or whatever and you're like why you know and then you figure out oh, actually that equation is also important for this and that and it's like oh it explained this and this and i said oh okay now it makes more sense and i'm much more interested and and I think you made a really good point about science not being what you're learning in the classroom. Uh, one thing I've reminded our audience here is that you have to learn the basics in the classroom. Like the classrooms give you the foundation of the things that other scientists have learned in the past that allow you to then start asking questions um, that no one knows the answers to, which is what practice of science is, is asking those questions that don't have a known answer yet. But you have to learn the equations, you have to understand you know, where this math comes from to be able to ask your own questions of the universe. Yeah. I think that's a really good point is that what you do when you become a scientist is very different from what you learn in a classroom. Um, although yes, exactly. I think many, yeah. many teachers are trying harder to help instill those processes that you might be doing as a real scientist. So we have to thank our teachers for that, that they're trying hard to show the processes of science, even if you're not doing them exactly the way that somebody might be doing them today. Yeah, and you know the, the foundations are important, right? But it's important to have a diversity set of, of, of foundations, also. I think you know because I mean nowadays research is really done in teams, and so you know it's you know everybody can bring something else onto the table. If everybody would have gone to the same exact teacher and learned the exact same foundation, you actually would make very little progress. You know we we need the diversity so that we can really you know get different kinds of ideas, and and then you know if you work in a team, somebody has maybe you know let's say picked up that part and somebody else is put in, in this other part. And when you come together, you can build something new that is, you know, and that, that is, you know, I think the creativity is something that is, is really crucial that you can ask interesting, you know, questions. 
Um, so I can see that there's a lot of, you know, things going on that it's just, you know, going blah, 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 blah. But, you know, you, I think asking the, the, the curious, the, the important question is, is, a, is something that is, is, is actually very, very important. Absolutely. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so we're about noon, but I want to ask two last quick questions. One, I've been having our audience get to know our, our guests a little bit better outside of what you do as a, a scientist. So is there anything uh, about yourself that you would be willing to share with us that might surprise us that maybe don't align with stereotypes of astronomers or scientists as we think of them, you know, or as they're portrayed in media or just something that you think would be fun for us to learn about you? Well, yeah, I, you know, I have, I have two kids. Um, so I'm like, you know, I'm not just focusing on science my whole life. I basically have a lot of other stuff going on. Um, so yeah, I, I have two kids. They take most of the, the time, especially currently. But um, I, I basically, you know, do a lot of sports with them, go out, um, you know, hiking and, and so on. Um, so that's, that's, that's one part. And then the other part, I, I played a lot of um, soccer, you know, uh, football um, in the past. So yeah, I, I always try to keep uh, work-life balance and I'm not just focusing only on science. So I think that's also something that's very important because um, you know, one could always work, you know, you, you know, because we are scientists are a lot of people that you have like your own company, right? And so you have to be make sure that you have this, 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 this work life balance at some point say like, okay, I've worked enough today, let's do something else. So I think having that is, 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 is crucially important. Yeah, that's great. And so in finding your own passions, you know, follow your passion of science, but also make sure you've got other things that you find interesting and embrace those as well. Yeah, I mean, for me, science is, is really my, my, you know, astronomy is really my passion. So I was like very lucky that I was just able to, you know, to work on that basically. Um, so it, it doesn't feel to me like work in the sense that I'm like, oh, you know, when is the hour up, right? So I, I'm, I'm very, you know, very excited about it. So, yeah. That's great. And we appreciate you sharing your excitement and your enthusiasm for your work with us. Uh, so I want to end the day with one last um, thing from you, which is, do you have any advice for our young audience um, that might be interested in a science career? Yes, I mean, I would say, you know, um, keep the tools broad. I wouldn't focus early on, on on just one topic. I would try to, you know, just follow your passion and try to, you know, to work on, on different things in the sense of just focus for example, on math or physics only, but try to keep it broad because you will see that you can always link different things together, right? Um, and, and so I think it's important that, that you keep an open mind, you know, if you don't find yet your passion, that's totally fine, I think. Um, just keep an open, open eye on it. But if you find something, then I would, would try to, you know, grab it and, and really try to, to follow it as much as you can. Um, yeah, I think that, that, that's my advice, you know, try to, to, to have fun um, with, with, with science, if, if possible. Like, you know, figure out things that, that you're curious about, right? Because a lot of things are, I can see even young kids, like, you know, they're very curious, right? They have tons of questions and somehow this gets lost with time. Um, but try to, to find this passion again, you know, as I'm, why is that, you know, and so on. And, and there are maybe some topics that you are very interested in, um, you know, that you ask most questions about and, and that can help you also to guide you later on, you know? And as I said, like, don't try to link what you learn at school to, to a scientific career. I, I think it's, it's quite different pairs of shoes. So, you know, even if you have, like, you know, I had physics courses in, in high school that I really didn't enjoy, uh, but I knew that that's not, not, that's not just physics, right? Um, so I would try to keep an open mind and also try to find, you know, peers, um, other people that have similar interests. So as I said, for me, I, I, I grew up close to an observatory as well. And so, you know, that was great for me because I could go up there. I, I was doing a lot of outreach talks there. I was able to talk with those kids, with students. I was talking with, with others. It, it helped me to, to understand what's going on in, in the field of astronomy a little bit. So, and I, I knew that that, that would be something that I really want to do. Um, and if you can do that as well, if you can find similar minded people, I think that that's, that, that's, that's really nice. But as I said, like, don't try to focus just on one thing, try to keep it, Kind of open-minded because for me i it was very non-clear that i want to get an astronomer like i you know i was in middle school and it just said there was this exam to go to high school and it was very uncertain that i passed because nobody in my family before me went to high school ever so i was like okay i go probably to middle school and do an apprenticeship which is like a vocal school 
um, in the travel agency business, right? Because all my parents did that, uh, you know, my parents did that and I was okay, I'm going to work in a travel agency because I love traveling. And, and then it somehow turned out like, oh no, um, I can actually go to high school if I want to. And I was like, oh, okay, why not, you know? And, and yeah, I, I, was, I was lucky to get into that, but I was always open to do something else as well. So I think, yeah, having a bit of flexibility and an open mind because a scientific career is not easy to plan. I mean, like I have, for example, a contract for another year and then I don't know where I will go. I have no clue in which country I will live. And, and that's, that's part of the, the deal, right? So I, I really have a, a fun, you know, um, let's say career science-wise, but it could end in a year and I need to find another job. And, and that's, that uncertainty is, is interesting, but you have also to be able to live with it. Um, and, and yeah, that's, that's part of, of, of the scientific career at the moment. I think that's, you know, obviously we have a lot of young audience out there that are in middle school and just starting to think about careers, but I think it's important to be honest with them that, you know, careers in science are a lot of fun. They're interesting. You get to learn every day, but there's also, it's not the easiest career to be a part of as far as the certainty year after year, particularly when you're getting started. So I think that's really good to be honest on both sides of that. But I think, you know, that's, that's true for most of careers nowadays. I think that, you know, most modern careers are like, yeah, you don't really know where you end up, um, you know, because the, the skill sets are, 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 are quite diverse and actually it's very fruitful to change, you know, companies and fields. And so it's not just within astronomy, actually, it's, 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 it's also beyond that. So having these typical jobs, like let's say 40 years ago or 50 years ago, where you start working for one company and keep working for the whole life in that company, I think these times are anyway kind of over. Um, and so this flexible mindset is anyway something that we have to get used to, I think. Um, but you know, for me, that's that's actually very enriching, right? I mean, I, I I grew up in Switzerland, I lived there, you know, and now with my family, we moved here. Um, you know, we spent here in the US, you know, the last few years, and it's, it has been great. Um, so I was really, you know, I learned a lot of new stuff. Um, we traveled through the you know the country, and and so from that point of view, um, you know, it's, it's it's also very nice, right? You can really learn, you know, different places. Uh, you can get to know people from different places. So I think that's, that's, it's, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's great. I think that's a great piece of advice for us to end on. So thank you. And thank you so much for being here with us today. It was wonderful. Yeah, it was much fun. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, those of you out there, thank you for joining us as well. And for your questions, we love hearing them. I want to remind you, we have actually added a few more dates to our Astro chat calendar. You can join us Thursday at 3 PM Eastern. Uh, with Federica Spoto. So we'll be talking with her in the afternoon. So join us then and hopefully we'll see your questions then. Thanks again for being with us. See you next time, everyone. <laughs>